Well, thank you. I feel quite at home in this room and at this podium, having taught many years uh, right here. Uh, Harry, you re reversed the titles, actually. Um, the overall title of all three lectures is Freedom, Obligation, and Love. And the title of this evening's lecture is uh, Embodiment, Choice, and Action though I don't know that it makes that much difference. <laughs> well, first let me say I'm honored to have been invited to deliver this year's Nathaniel Taylor Lectures. When I look back on the many Taylor lecturers who have preceded me, and some, many of whom I heard give their lectures, all I can say is that I am humbled to be in any way in their company. As the overall title of this series of lectures indicates, I intend to consider questions about human freedom, obligation, and love, and the interconnections of these questions with one another. The central focus of all three lectures will be on freedom of choice, our experience of it, its meaning for us, and the ways in which it matters, or not, in the whole of our lives. My analysis will be drawing on scientific, philosophical, and theological perspectives. My thesis for the lectures as a whole is that every free choice is ultimately a choice of what and how to love. Although my primary focus throughout these lectures is on freedom of choice, I can't abstract completely from other questions that are in fairly obvious ways preliminary to examinations of the experience of choice. I think especially of the disputed question of whether or not a genuinely free choice is ever possible for us and also questions about the achievement of conditions of freedom, as in, for example, psychological, political, economic freedom. In another time, it might be possible to bracket such questions, leaving them to others to embrace and perhaps fashion new resolutions. I could then begin simply with the presupposition that freedom of choice lies at the heart of our moral lives, and thus narrow my search to its manifestations. After all, with my focus on the experience of free choice, my central task is to probe what it is, not whether it can ever exist or what the conditions must be in order to foster it. I am, in fact, quite sympathetic with the often cited comment on free choice attributed to Samuel Johnson, which was, all theory is against it, but all experience is for it. Nonetheless, theoretical and practical questions about the sheer possibility of human free choice are currently acute enough that it seems disingenuous to ignore them altogether. In this first lecture, therefore, which I entitle Embodiment, Choice, and Action, I will describe and try to clarify some of these questions. In particular, I want to consider key challenges to freedom of choice generated by contemporary scientific research. I do this here, however, not finally to adjudicate the heated debate surrounding these challenges, which is a much larger task than fits the time of these lectures. In fact, what I say about them will be more in the mode of observations about the current state of these debates than about a resolution of the problems involved, although I try a little bit at that, too. Still, I approach these issues and problems for three reasons. First, these are issues that do bear directly on presuppositions regarding human free choice and the moral life. 
Second, the issues are not yet closed down by all researchers in the scientific community, and certainly not by all philosophers and theologians. Third, even if every contemporary scientific theory, or philosophical or theological theory for that matter, were to be against free choice as such, I hope to show ultimately in these lectures that my analysis of the experience of free choice can shed light even on these theories, that is, the ones against free choice. In addition to paying attention to the preliminary question of the possibility of freedom of choice, I will in this lecture attempt to clarify various meanings of freedom, to suggest a key methodological approach to an analysis of the experience of free choice, and finally, to actually begin this analysis, paving the way for my second lecture next Tuesday, which will propose the analysis of free choice or the experience of free choice as a whole. In the third and final lecture in the series, I'll complete the analysis by focusing on free choice as a moral choice and by considering its theological implications. There's a way in which the lecture tonight might be entitled Whether, and the one on Tuesday will be called What is Free Choice, and the one Thursday is Why Free Choice. So, all right, the possibility of human free choice. Despite new sources for insight into what I call preliminary questions, none of these questions are as such completely new. This means that in pursuing them, we enter into ongoing conversations stretching from the past to the present. The issue, for example, of determinism versus human freedom of choice haunts a great part of the history of human thought in one form or another, especially but not solely in Western intellectual history. It represents the great struggle, debate, that has on one side those who argue that just about everything, including human action, is determined or even predetermined, necessitated, to be just as it is, and hence wholly predictable if only we could gain all rele relevant knowledge in its regard. On the other side are those who argue that no matter what else is determined in the world, there exists an opening, a possibility for human choice that is, in an important sense, free. Such choice, to put it simply, would be choice of actions and attitudes that are not already completely predetermined, not wholly necessitated by past factors and outside forces, and therefore able to be otherwise than they are if a human agent so chooses. Put negatively, for an individual to choose freely is to choose without other agents, situations, or conditions preempting, taking over, wholly determining human actions, and thereby eliminating the individual human's own agency. If the struggle between ideas and convictions about determinism and free choice seems never to get resolved, it is because someone always retrieves the position that looks to have been defeated, and someone else inevitably raises doubts about a point of view that once had appeared to triumph. If anything, this testifies to the complexity of the issues and to the apparent high stakes involved for individuals and societies. Hence, for example, ancient convictions about the relationship of fate 
to human tragedy reappear in modern theories of social determinism. Metaphysical questions about the incompatibility of divine causality and human freedom modulate into theological questions about divine election versus universal salvation, as well as theologies of grace in relation to nature and sin in relation to grace. Discoveries regarding the power and extension of the unconscious, especially un unconscious levels of brain function, challenge both the reality and the efficaciousness of any conscious free choice. And in the mix of such continuously competing positions, there also remains a kind of common sense belief that humans are free to self-direct at least some of their actions, and hence they are responsible for actions they choose. Families, societies, communities, and nations continue to judge human actions as right or wrong, culpable or inculpable, on the presumption that some reasonable form of human agency, usually individual but sometimes also corporate, validates responsibility and justifies praise or blame. As the years and centuries go by, the staying power of issues of free choice and determinism has been remarkable. Complexities in insights have yielded unending subtleties of analysis and argument. Since the work of William James, we respect those who simply decide to believe in free choice, those who prefer soft determinism to hard, and those who search the ways in which radical freedom may be compatible or not with the, with the randomness of indeterminism as well as determinism. I'm not going to rehearse the long history of concepts and theories within the freedom and determinism debate. Others have done this comprehensively and well. What I will do, however, is to look at elements introduced most recently into this debate through the contributions of multiple scientific disciplines, especially biology, psychology, anthropology, sociobiology, and the neurosciences. At first glance, it appears that scientific theories about human action strongly favor biological and evolutionary determinism. To some extent, this is because of a widespread dissatisfaction with all forms of dualism between mind and body, physical and mental action, volition and hardwired brain structures. The scientific default position is that material reality can account for and absorb the meaning of whatever reality remains designated as mental or non-physical, including so-called freedom of choice. Hence, human agency, insofar as it exists, has its rationale and function only in physical mechanisms of the human brain. It is governed not by self-initiating free choice, conscious free choice, but by physical laws of nature, one of which is that the physical can affect what is non-physical, but what's non-physical can have no effect on what's physical. In addition, and from a wider perspective, evolutionary biology casts doubt on human freedom insofar as a relentless drive toward genetic self-reproduction is thought to determine overall the actions of all living organisms, human and otherwise. Now more specifically, I hope your eyes aren't glazing over, and <laughs> I'm, trying to, um, I'm trying to make this succinct um, and clear, but I may not 
succeed completely, but I'm trying. So, but write down questions because you can ask them afterwards or, or correct me on something afterwards. More specifically, scientific research directly on issues of human free choice reveals some additional serious challenges to the possibility of free choice. For example, Harvard psychologist Daniel Wegner identifies what he calls conscious will in human experience, but concludes finally that this experience is illusory. Our minds, he says, report to us an experience of will, but in fact, conscious choice is unable to cause any action. The necessary physical mechanisms that are the real causes of human behavior, which are in the unconscious for him, are never themselves present in consciousness. However much the experience of conscious will signals to us an emotion or indicator of personal authorship, it has no causal effect on action. Other scientific researchers acknowledge that if there is some freedom of choice, it can emerge only when there is conscious awareness, presumably of alternative options and the possibility of choosing. But new understandings of the structure and functions of the brain and of the nature and expansiveness of the unconscious indicate that at best, consciousness offers us only a tip of the iceberg in terms of our knowing the causes of what may seem to be free choice. Genetic forces, biochemical influences, neural connections, electrical circuitry, cellular activations are all at work in the initiation and direction of human activity whether automatic or voluntary. Voluntary does not mean free, necessarily. Scientific instruments of research, such as brain scanners, reveal something of these to us now. Now, you know, uh, some of you may be more familiar with all of this than I am. Some of you not as familiar, since I've been working at it for quite a while. But uh, it's in the news, almost every week, in the news. In the New York Times, more than every week sometimes. So it's, it's in front of us one way or another. So scientific instruments of research, such as brain scanners, reveal something of this to us now. But in any given situation of potential choice, hardly any of this is accessible to ordinary conscious awareness and assessment. This raises the related question of how unconscious and conscious factors in the brain are organized for decision making. The brain, after all, has a plethora of systems and countless millions of localized processes which must participate in what are now called brain decisions. These are part of both unconscious and conscious decision making. Although there are overall genetically determined neural networks in the brain, these grow and are modified through the influence of neural activity stimulated by elements in the environment and by training, sort of kind of our neurons gain experience over time. But how are they coordinated? Reminiscent of the philosopher Gilbert Ryle's rejection of what he called a ghost in the machine running things, um, scientists today are largely adamant that, as neuroscientist Michael Gazanika puts it, there is, quote, no little man who is boss inside the brain, and I, one could say no little woman who's boss inside the brain either. And anthropologist Melvin Conner, describing the brain 
as the organ of behavior and of consciousness, insists that there is no center to the brain, no locatable I, only multiple functions that play out in circuits. Who or what, then, is the decision maker when it comes to complex, conscious forms of human action? One answer is that brains and other bodily systems and organs function like a Swiss clock. They self-run without need of a distinctive guide. They are not machines in an ordinary sense, but they are alive with a kind of global agency within. Their internal unity, such as it is, is organic. The common characteristic of complex systems, it is said, is that they display organization without any external organizing principle being applied. Now, external doesn't mean out here. External means uh, the ghost in the machine, something in here, but that's, that's working everything else that's in here. It's distinct from it, though. Unity is provided by the information from multiple systems interacting and being woven together, as long as each part of the brain and the nervous system functions as it's supposed to. No separate guiding entity, no ghost, no I, is needed. And free choice in any ordinary sense is a fiction. One way in which neuroscientists have claimed to have established empirical evidence of the impossibility of consciously made free choices is through experiments regarding the timing of brain decision making as contrasted with conscious free choice. That is, measurements have shown a difference between the time when an electrical decision-making charge takes place in the brain and the time when a re research subject indicates conscious awareness of making that decision. With the right technology, brain activity can be detected seconds or milliseconds before research subjects report making a conscious decision even before they become aware of their intention to decide to act. Now, these, these experiments are something like this. I'm oversimplifying it, but a research subject is put before different buttons, and the buttons connect to different options, um, whether words or letters or whatever, and uh, they're going to make a choice which button to push and what the light goes on, which one of the options. So that's the choice that's structured for the research subjects. In the meantime, uh, it's being measured what's in their brains, and what they find is this electrical charge goes off in the brain before they hit the button. Before and afterwards, they will say, even before they had figured out which button they wanted to hit, which choice they would make. It's very interesting. <laughs> um, I find it, anyway, fascinating. This finding, it is claimed, supports the conclusion that all decisions are made in the physical, that is, pre-conscious, non-conscious, unconscious, networks of the brain before they are experienced as being made consciously in a person's apparent free choice. Hence, conscious free choice is not really free. It is the result of what is supported by the brain as well as predetermined in and by the brain. Both theoretical argument and empirical evidence, then, appear to place scientific opinion solidly in the determinist camp and strongly against the possibility of genuine freedom of choice. Yet, the question of this possibility of choice remains open, even scientifically. Not just because there are some scientists who affirm it, 
but because even among scientists who have reason to deny it, there are doubts and sometimes counter arguments given to their otherwise strong determinism. Benjamin Libay, for example, maintains the validity of his, he was one of the first to do this kind of experiment that I was describing, maintains the validity of his scientific research on the timing question, but he also offers the proposal that what it points to is a readiness potential in the brain, a kind of gearing up for decision making, which can include an electric charge for more than one option. This, in turn, gives what he calls that the, the fact that there are more than one option comes finally to the conscious level uh, and uh, a veto power is given to, uh, pre to conscious choice, presumably real choice. So these questions are not all settled. Similarly, despite uh, the Harvard psychologist Daniel Wegner, whom I uh, referred to before, despite his rather dramatic labeling of conscious choice as an illusion, he goes to some lengths to provide reasons why he nonetheless values consciously experienced free choice. The illusory aspect of it, illusory because it's conscious after the fact, after the work is already done by the unconscious. The illusory aspect of it, even though it means we are, as he says, technically wrong in our, identifying, our, identif our identification of the true cause of our actions, nonetheless, it's deemed profoundly significant in itself. And here I just quote a few of his sentences. The intentions and conscious thoughts we have about our actions are cues to ourselves and to others about the meaning and likely occurrence of our behavior. Illusory or not, this, I'm still quoting him, illusory or not, conscious free choice is the person's guide to his or her own moral responsibility for action. Sometimes, I'll tell you when I end the quote, sometimes how things seem is more important than what they are. The feeling of doing is how it seems, not what it is, but that is as it should be. Parsing this final term, turn in Wagner's position is work for another time and place, but it is a work that will keep open the debate about determinism and free will. Michael Gazzaniga, whom I also cited before, uh, despite a straightforward alliance with certain forms of determinism, in the end affirms the possibility of free choice. He's the neuro a neuroscientist. His focus on the complexity of systems, the probabilities, hence unpredictability, in their interactions, the possibilities of emergent new layers of systems within organisms, all of this bodes well for some kind of conscious freedom of choice, he thinks. The brain itself is a layered system he argues, productive of new and unpredictable layers, from the automatic non-conscious to the unconscious to conscious thought, and from simple awareness to subjective self-awareness. Even radical novelty, novelty is possible. New layers are organized in new ways, and the whole is more than the sum of its parts. We cannot, for example, he says, I love this example, we cannot predict a tango by studying only neurons. The upshot is that somehow we must find room for both determinism and non-determinism, both predictability and choice. Melvin Connor, who I also mentioned before, the anthropologist, he has this absolutely marvelous book. It's in a new edition 
called The Tangled Wing, Biological Constraints on the Human Spirit, which is a very massive multidisciplinary work. He is even more explicit regarding not only the possibility of free choice, but the imperative that we exercise it. Human physical and mental processes surely are biologically determined in important respects, he says, but biology alone is often not decisive for human behavior. Connor ends his massive study of biological constraints on human possibilities with the observation that these are better described as biological influentialism than biological determinism. Genes, for example, do determine human structures and behavior, but given other shapers of behavior, such as environment, nutrition, hormones, genetic determination is often far from fixed. And evolutionary imperatives of species survival and reproductive advantage will be better served, he thinks, by choices in the present to preserve the environment than by waiting for significant genetic change in a fragile and five millennia distant future. It could take five millennia to change things, waiting for the genes to do it all, however determining they are. There are really important things that need to be done now, and they are more important than sitting back and saying, well, the genes will ultimately work it out. <laughs> From my own perspective, let me say simply, there can be no doubt that the neurosciences, as well as psychology and other cognitive scientific disciplines, have achieved remarkable advances in the knowledge of the brain and other parts of the body. Contributions to medicine alone make this work invaluable. I am convinced also of the importance of this work for philosophers and theologians, at least to take account of it. There are, of course, plenty of critics of the presuppositions and of the resultant scientific theories that attend this work. Respected critics within and without scientific communities. For example, the validity of certain scientific philosophical principles has been criticized. Perhaps especially the principle I mentioned early that what is non-physical cannot affect the physical at all. And some of them, some of the appeals here, I don't, I don't have time to, to talk about all of this, but one of the arguments is that as biology and some of the other sciences become perhaps more and more entrenched in a kind of deterministic approach to questions of human cap capability, at the same time, physics has gone in the other direction. Because physics now takes very seriously non-determinism. I mean, chaos theory and all the rest of it has, has opened up the possibility that nothing is predictable. Not only is everything, not everything predictable, but nothing is predictable. Fascinating. Uh, the, some of the... Uh, more in, some of the more interesting critiques, I think, generally, for at least many of you, is a, a book recently published by, um, by Marilyn Robinson, you know, the novelist, etc. cetera. Uh, her Terry lectures at Yale have been published uh, a few months ago. And she takes on all of this in a way that I don't feel comfortable doing, not because she knows more. I, I don't think it's all negative. I think it's all extremely important. On the other hand, uh, her book is extremely profound. Um, the title of it is Absence of Mind. And the subtitle is The Dispelling of Inwardness from the Modern Myth of the Self. It's, it's, um, it's worth reading. 
Another one is by uh, British philosopher Mary Midgley, uh, her book that came out about 10 years ago, which, uh, which takes, I, I, I would say, is a bit more positive toward the importance of scientific uh, research for philosophy than uh, Marilyn Robinson is. But at the same time, her plea is you have to have multi-disciplines working on these questions because that's the nature of the questions. Pleas for multidisciplinary contributions are warranted if the question of the possibility of free choice is not to be closed prematurely. Challenges to excessive theoretical reliance on automatic internal systems in the brain for governance of human behavior are as useful as challenges to too little appreciation of these systems. Demands for wider purviews in interpreting and valuing insights into human inwardness, relationality, and creativity can foster, not defeat, efforts at research. From a variety of perspectives and disciplines, there's already important new agreement on some things. For example, that mind and body are not separate substances needing only to be bridged together. No one cares much, no one cares much for dualism anymore. Dual aspects of humans is more acceptable language to deal with hitherto intractable divides. And by the way, I, I have a section in my, the book that Harry mentioned, Just Love, on mind-body relationship that relates to some of this as well, but it's just a short, short section. There is also agreement that whatever mind is, it is futile to look for it in some one physical spot in the brain. Strict material monism raises more question than it answers, perhaps. Construing mind as the activity of the brain seems reasonable to more and more scholars though it is not always clear whether this is coextensive with all or only some of the brain's levels of activity. There is also significant agreement that consciousness holds only part of the secret of our awakened life, the tip of the iceberg. Dependent as it is on the unconscious, as well as on multiple other processes in the brain. To understand mind-body unity, or duality in unity, the question may be whether or not we know enough about matter to, ab to be able to understand human minds. And will our understanding of embodied mind ever finally help us to understand selves? Now, the when I say that about matter, there's a lot of writing, uh, marvelous writing, going on about how, again, a lot of it is deriving from physics, about, uh, you know, everything is in some sense alive. Well, of course it isn't. Here's a stone. It's not alive. But, you know, if subatomic part particles are now packages of energy, they're not just inert blobs, but very small. And it reminds me, reading some of this, of uh, Teilhard de Chardin, if you will. Some of you may recognize that. In at least indirect pursuit of such questions, I turn now to begin to examine the meaning and structure of freedom of choice. I'm moving now from the whether to the what, not claiming to have solved the whether, but to have raised the questions and to at least um, from my perspective at this point, to say there's, there's a window of opportunity for multidisciplines to work on these together, or at least to know what one another is saying. Although it may sound, therefore, like I'm moving into and talking about a world vastly different from the world of science, this is not completely the case. I just want another look at that tip of the iceberg human consciousness. So I move to freedom and the act of choosing. And these are just three short things I'm going to do, and then I'll be ready to do the major analysis in my le second lecture. <clears throat> 
As I indicated at the beginning of this lecture, my full analysis of conscious free choice will have to wait for next Tuesday. This afternoon, I only begin it with some terminological clarifications, a comment about method, and one first step into the analysis of freedom of choice. So first, terminological clarifications. Freedom, as you know, has many meanings. We speak of freedom from, freedom for, freedom as a capability or a power, freedom as a condition, and finally, freedom as an action. Since my concern here is with freedom as an action, the action of free choice, I'm right now interested in these other forms of freedom only insofar as they relate to the action of choice. And I should say, I'm just going to give the meaning of these terms, <clears throat> different uses of freedom. I'm not making a case that, uh, that they have any valid references, reference in reality. But this is what the terms mean. Freedom as a human capability, for example, means a capability for making free choices. As such, it is understood to mean our capability to be, in some sense, self-determining. It is what allows us to take possession of ourselves as agents, to affect the orientation and meaning of our lives, and to determine, in some important sense, our own destiny. It is not a separate entity within us, the capability for free choice, if there is one. It's not another ghost in the machine, but a capability, a characteristic of us as humans to perform act actions of free choice. Freedom, on the other hand, as a condition for acting, for making choices, is a state of affairs in which we are neither coerced in our actions nor prevented from choosing at least some of our actions, often referred to as circumstantial or situational freedom. It is freedom from obstacles, opposing forces, internal barriers to choice. It is therefore freedom for choosing and doing what we choose. Freedom is an internal condition, or as an internal condition, means the absence of or freedom from internal constraints such as psychological compulsions, inordinate fears and desires, ignorance, debilitating illness, timid imagination, brain damage, low energy, overwhelming confusion. If you have any of those, your condition for making free choices is limited, at least. Examples of freedom as a positive internal condition, freedom for, are personal courage, useful knowledge, integration of mind and heart, self-acceptance, a kind of liberty of spirit, maybe even hope. As an external condition for acting, freedom, in a negative sense first, again, is the absence of what would limit or destroy our capacity or our, our free action. For example, imprisonment, denial of education, or of political or economic opportunity, and various forms of oppression and repression. Positive external conditions for freedom of choice can include, for example, secured rights to political participation, freedom of movement, and the maintenance of situations of peace and order. As you know or can surmise from these examples, these sorts of conditions, negative or positive, internal or external, admit of degrees degrees. They can enhance free choice or inhibit it and make choices possible or not. Now a comment on method of the analysis I'm going to be doing, just to starting a little bit now, but then uh, uh, on Tuesday. 
So I moved to freedom of action. My approach to understanding the act of free choice is through an exploration of the conscious experience of freedom of choice. A simple method of self-reflection self on our experience might be sufficient. However, there is much that enters consciousness that ordinarily remains outside the light of our attention. We might say that it is only implicit in our conscious awareness. Now, what I'm talking, I'm, I'm skipping this, uh, most of this section. Let me just try to say what I'm trying to say by this. Um, we have, uh, we have a lot of things in our conscious awareness that we don't attend to. So for example, someone might ask me a question while I'm so engrossed in my own thoughts or taken up with another person's issues that it only dawns on me a minute or two later that someone else was trying to get my attention, right? It, it was in my consciousness, but I was not attending to it. Or I may walk past someone on the street and only when I've gone some paces beyond her do I have a second take, so to speak, and become aware that the other is an old friend. It's sort of like peripheral vision. All right, you're all looking forward or whatever, and, and you're not paying attention to your peripheral vision, if you're lucky enough to have it. I mean, sometimes. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. So to do an analysis of conscious free choice, our experiences of them, is going to mean, well, we just sort of think about it and then put this down, this down, that must be part. No, it's a matter of attending to what we hadn't attended to before, seeing in it what we hadn't seen. So I think that's as much as I'm going to say about, uh, about the method. But what that means is, what's important about that is, I'm not looking for uh, how it is you came to, to desire such and such. You know, you learned something at your mother's knee or you uh, had a terrible experience at one point in your life. Or what. So that's why you are where you are. That's not the analysis I'm doing uh, or will do. Uh, it's what is in conscious awareness now, and what can it tell us about the meaning of free choice? So I'm going to move then uh, immediately to my last short piece, which is um, the first step in the analysis of the experience of free choice. Now, I will I'm, think of a think of a Think of a free choice that you remember having made. And then I'm just going to start trying to describe something that's in that experience. And then it'd be up to you to say, no, 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 that's not in my experience. You're wrong. It'd be easy. But I'm only going to take one step. There are many more steps that I will take, uh, not tonight. So the first step in reflecting on our experience of free choice. Like other actions, we can learn the meaning of free choice by learning about its object. Now, what I mean by that is this. You know, we say, when we're trying to understand what it means to see, we start thinking about the visible. We even define seeing in relation to the visible. The object of seeing tells us something about the action of seeing. Similarly, when we're trying to describe what it means to hear, uh, then we start talking about the audible. And uh, we define hearing somehow in relation to its object, which is something audible. Similarly, we learn something about free choice by asking the question, what is it that we choose when we choose? The object of the choice. This immediate question does not ask what are all the particular options each of us might have had or have, not who or what are the particular persons or things, attitudes or states of affairs that we may choose, but what, if any, 
are the consistent structural elements in every object of our choice. If we think then about an experience we have had of making a choice, what do we find regarding the content of its object? First, first thing we find, I'm suggesting anyway, is the object of choice is first of all an action. The object of choice, what we choose when we choose, is an action. It is always something that I can do, or at least I think I can. Now, we tend to think of ourselves as choosing all sorts of things, external objects. I choose coffee or tea. I choose this job or that job. I choose this person or that person. But more accurately, it doesn't mean anything to say simply, I choose coffee or tea. I choose this person or that person. Unless I mean that I'm choosing some action in their regard. Nothing happens. If I just say, I choose coffee, well, Wegner's right. It's a, it's a fiction. I mean, nothing happens. <laughs> nothing is effected. Choice is an empty term, unless it means that, for example, I choose to drink coffee or tea, or to buy coffee or tea, or to sell coffee or tea, or to prefer coffee to tea. Or my other example, this job or that doesn't mean anything. I say, I choose this job, I choose job A, not job B. Well, that doesn't mean anything at all unless I mean I choose to work in job A or B, or I choose to apply for job A or B, or I choose to accept job A or B. Or the third example, to choose a person. What does that mean? Nothing, unless I mean I choose to love this person, or I select this person to work with me on a project, or I call this person on the phone rather than that person. This is why free choice is called self-determining because it determines myself in action. Now, not just any action can be the object for choice, however. There are at least three qualifications of an act if it's going to be in a potential object for choice. First, it has to be an action of my own, not yours, mine. I can't choose your action. The only actions I can choose directly and immediately are my own actions. We have some control over our own actions. We do not have such control over the actions of others. Now, you're probably objecting. Sometimes it seems as if we are choosing actions for others, as of, of others as in getting them to behave in ways we want them to behave, or choosing for them what we decide should be their right actions. But if we consider it more closely, we find that the actions of others can be objects of my choice only insofar as they are objects of my action first. Hence, I can choose to persuade others to act in a certain way. But the persuading is first my action. It's aimed at someone else's, but it's my action. Without it, again, nothing, nothing. Vacuum. I can choose to assist someone else in doing something, to influence someone's choice of action, even coerce their activity through some action of my own. In such cases, I am directly choosing my own action whether to persuade, assist, influence, coerce, whatever, with the goal of determining someone else's action. The immediate action to be chosen, however, is my own. I'm almost done now, so this is short. A second qualification of an action, if it is to be chosen, if it can be chosen, is it has to be in the present, here, now. 
The choice may be to initiate an action or to continue an action or to change an action, but in any case, it must be chosen as present. The act of choice and the chosen act are temporally contiguous. We do, of course, sometimes make present choices with our eyes on the future, on our future actions. So again, maybe you'd say that, that can't be right then. They all, it also, always has to be a choice of a present action. But uh, I can, well here's an example, a simple one. I can choose tonight to get up early tomorrow morning, say at five o'clock. I wanna get up at five o'clock tom tomorrow morning, so tonight I choose, that's the time I'm gonna get up tomorrow. When the alarm goes off, however, I have another choice to make. <laughs> Unless there is some way I can program myself so that I will of necessity get up at five. I, I hired somebody to come and drag me out of bed or something. I mean, you can always qualify these things so you could see, but somehow, um, somehow it remains the case. My free choice at one moment is not powerful enough to determine my actions at another. Now, here's a problem too. A choice of present action can, however, make a difference for future actions. It can influence future actions, change the context of future actions. In fact, this is the particular point of some kinds of present choices, such as promise-making, pledge-giving, commitment-undertaking, resolving. Such present choices do not completely determine future actions, but they do influence them, and that is their aim. In the present, an efficacious choice of the action of promise-making, for example, changes here and now, in the present, I make you a promise, changes the relationship between you and me. I am now bound in a new way because I gave you my word. And you hold it and you can claim it back. As the future unfolds, therefore, my original choice I promise you, yields the need for a new choice. When I get to the future, what I'm trying to say is, I make you a promise, that doesn't settle it. I still have to keep it. And that's what I can't determine. But I can make, in making a promise, I'm doing something that sets it up so that I hope I will do, I'll be better able to do it. I'll have other reasons to do it. So my choice in the present yields the need for a new choice or many new choices as the future unfolds to ratify and sustain my promise to be now though, to sign that something happened in the present is now my choice when we reach a new point in time is, is not, well, I'll keep it or not. It's a choice to be faithful or to be betray. It's a new kind of choice. The story of my choosing is not yet complete. The meaning of past choices can be in the present and the meaning of present choices in the future. Still, every choice, every efficacious actual choosing is of an action in the present. And the last and third qualification of an action to be chosen is that it must at least appear to be possible. The act of free, doesn't mean I can't choose something and then I find out later I can't do it. But I'm saying to choose it, it has to appear to be possible. The act of free choice is an efficacious act in that effect, it effectively activates the action that is its ob object. I'm saying we're talking about the action, which is in the object, it's part of what I choose. That action gets activated if I actually choose it bad action and not another one. 
If an action is perceived to be in no way possible for the agent, then try as she might, her only alternative is what ethicists call a valeity. In other words, wishful thinking. Suppose, for example, I want to fly up to the ceiling of this room. It'd be great to get another perspective on this room, right? <laughs> so I want to do that. But short of entering the world of Harry Potter, I know I can't do it. I know I can't do it. So I could say, I'm choosing, and I'm choosing, and I'm choosing. I'm not choosing. Nothing is happening. I may, of course, choose to try to do it, since a form of effort, trying, may indeed be perceived by me and may even actually be possible. I'm going to say, I'm going to try to do it. Like if I put a chair on a chair on a chair, you know, that's different. It's now in the realm of possibility. I end here. In medias race, in the middle of my description, I'm not even in the middle. I'm on the first step <laughs> of this description of the experience of free choice. I've tried in this lecture to take account of, indeed to appreciate, scientific perspectives on the possibility of human free choice. I will not leave any of this behind in my next lectures. However, I have already begun to turn to another perspective, the perspective to be gained through analysis of the conscious experience of free choice. This is an experience that most scientists at least acknowledge, but seldom pursue. For some, it is overly ethereal, an illusion, almost an afterthought of serious analysis of the biological possibilities of free choice. This may be as it should be, since this form of experience is more likely to be in the province of philosophers and theologians and psychologists with a philosophical bent. The brain, I affirm, is utterly important to us a part of us without which we cannot make choices. Full appreciation of the biological processes in the brain may, however, presume wider processes lodged in and sharing in the driving of each human life as a whole. So next week, my pursuit of these will take us into the role of human, not just actions in the object of choice, but of desires and loves, as well as human knowledge, judgment, and moral discernment. Finally, through understanding the experience of free choice, I will look next week, Tuesday, for an opening to an understanding of ourselves as embodied, yet transcendent, relational, and free. And in my final lecture, I will explore this understanding, not only in relation to ourselves, but to our neighbor and to God. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for a, a wonderful talk. We have uh, about uh, 10, 15 minutes for some uh, Q&A. And please speak into the mic, because all of this is being recorded. So questions? Just look, <clears throat> I'd just be grateful for a couple of clarifications on the, your step one. Um, I was wondering first, you spoke about preference in terms of coffee and tea as being a choice. And I wondered if preference or taste, um, for example, attraction can really be considered choices. I suppose the second clarification is, um, is non-action a choice? So in terms of the second um, condition in the present, are we, choosing, if, are we choosing when we don't act if there's a possibility yeah. of acting in a different way? I have a mic, so I guess I can answer from here. Um, yes to both of your questions. The second one is easier. Yes, choice can be between doing and not doing. 
as well as being doing this or that. Uh, the question of whether to prefer can be an action. I clearly think it is. We often think about prep. We all have preferences. Da -da. They're sort of things we have. They're already formed in us or something. But to prefer, I said I could choose to prefer coffee or tea. To prefer is more complicated. Um, it, uh, to prefer a as a term really means I have to prefer this over that, which means I have to have a different reason for preferring this instead of this and not preferring this instead of that, however you want. Prefer has a two-sided aspect about it. It's a comparative judgment. And however you describe it beyond that, yes, it's an action. It's an action. Hi, thanks very much for the lecture. Um, I really, really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to the next ones to come. Thank I was just wondering in uh, your uh, interdisciplinary look at some of these things, if you looked at uh, and whether we should expect to see in your lectures any looking at 20th century phenomenologists like Husserl or Malou Ponty. Yeah. Well, not in these lectures. I have looked a lot at. <laughs> Uh, Sartre, Marilyn Ponty, Ricoeur, I mean, they do some of the best, for me, most interesting work on free choice. But I don't have time to do all that. I'm doing my own phenomenology, you could say that. But I will refer to them next week uh, as I go along. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying to think of, in the way you're defining choice. If I choose to lose 20 pounds and um, I don't do anything about that, um, have I, are you saying that I really haven't made a choice? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not a very good one. <laughs> no. Um, I did, just in passing at one point, say we do make choices and find out that we can't do them or we betray them or whatever else. It could still have been a choice. If I actually uh, made a choice between this or that and now I have to carry it out and it, uh, it wasn't a very powerful choice if I don't do anything about it, usually what will happen in an example like that, I'll do something about it and then then that's the end of the choice. But uh, some people, uh, one, of, one, of my, one of my favorite philosoph contemporary philosophers who's worked a lot on free choice is um, Harry Frankfurt. And uh, you know, everybody talks about free choice. They say you have to have alternatives. So that's an issue I'm going to address next week, too. I'm not sure you have to have alternatives, but it's, a, it's very important in an ordinary sense for choice. Otherwise, you don't have to choose. Um, and he had what he called the principle of alternative uh, possibilities. You, you, here's an alter you can have a choice because here's something you're considering, but here's something that's an alternative and their intention. That's, that's what a choice is for. And he gives, and then later he, he uh, negates that view on his part. Uh, you don't have to have an alternative. And, um, and the reason he gives, oh, I, this is going to take too long, but somehow in the examples that he uses primarily, here is someone making choices, going through life, and there's somebody out here who has power over this person as, as a, you know, a, a, a magician or something can, can, has the power to reach into this person and flick the choice this way or flick the choice that way and so on. So it turns out that um, here is this person going along. He thinks he could do otherwise. He could pick one alternative or another and he makes a choice. Uh, so it's a real choice. It has two alternatives. But here's this guy out here who knows that he couldn't do this other choice, because if he started to, he's going to go in there and make him do it the other way. And he concludes on that, so, so it's not that there is another possible choice. But my response to that is, 
the choice and the actual doing of the action can be separate. They can be. And in that, his case, you know, here you are, you're making a choice. You don't, unbeknownst to you, some powerful person is a hold, has a, a possible hold on your mind. And if you don't go the way they want you to, then, uh, then it's, you don't have a possible alternative because you just keep going. And if you were going to choose another alternative, it disappears because this powerful person is going to make it disappear. But this person still made a choice in my view. I, I don't think that Frankfurt's withdrawal of his principle of uh, it could be otherwise needs to, needs to be that way. So, but this is, but you know, the example of if I choose to go on a diet, beginning of Lent, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, that can be a very real choice. Of course it can. But we very well know what I was saying before. You cannot determine future actions in the present. You can set up a situation. You can plan to do it. You can put safeguards. You can uh, promise someone you'll do it. You can do all of that. But you can't settle it now. It's a very amazing sort of thing. Now, I'm going to talk about I, the examples I've been using are pretty trivial examples because they're easier in a way. But I'm really interested in the examples about, well, I said my thesis overall is every choice is a choice of what and how to love. So I'm really interested in the most important choices of what and how to love. So I'll try to use more profound examples maybe next time. But yeah. I hadn't thought about this before, and I'm not sure I can even express it, um, what, what I'm getting at, but you were talking about the experiments where things were happening in the brain, and then a choice, mm -hmm. it, it, you were, it was able to be measured that the choice yeah. came after. Yes. Intuition, um, it seems that, I mean, maybe it didn't happen this way, but it's, as I think back, decisions that I've made, I'm something's happening in my brain as I'm trying to make the decision. But it almost seems like separate from that, my whole body has a sense of something intuitively that I should be doing. Is there, does that come into it? I mean, if, what, was an attempt made to measure that as two distinct things, the things happening in the body as opposed to in the brain? And not that I know of. It's not in the uh, research that I've read about. But I, I think you're exactly right. And the fact that LeBay said, maybe this is not the choice is being made ahead of time, and then somehow it, it uh, triggers something at the conscious level. But there's a readiness, a readiness, he says, a readiness. And that makes complete sense to me. When we're in the process of making decisions, uh, all kinds of things are going on in the brain. And I would imagine, as you're saying, that for for some choices in the body as well. Uh, that makes utter sense to me. So that it's not a simple, an electric charge goes off, and then, then I make my decision, and so there must be something out of whack. There must not have been a decision consciously at all, just all happened. That seems to me not, not uh, I don't want to say true to experience because the response would be, well, that's the point, you see. So, um, but, uh, but that makes sense to me. That That's why I think that the knowledge that we have of ourselves as biological beings, psychological beings, and so on, it's not the same knowledge you get if you go to a psychiatrist for something. It's a knowledge of fullness of life. And we don't experience ourselves as automatons. Now, we do in certain circumstances. We have all kinds of experiences, right? Oh, I know something I, I thought of when I was reading about those experiments. And then the one, the one experimenter who said, maybe this is just a readying for choice, and yet the real choice will take place at the conscious level. I found myself thinking of uh, strategies for decision making, such as the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. They're all strategy for decision making, which means a lot goes on in our mind and heart 
before we make the decision. And in fact, it's important that it does so that we make a, the better decision. There may be something analogous there between the, the role of the body and the brain and the role of conscious awareness. Maybe a stretch as an analogy too, but it came to my mind. Let's take one more question. Um, this, I think, actually is, even though I had thought of the question before, kind of related to what he just asked. Um, is it possible to make a choice where the action is internal, where you're choosing what to pay attention to, is what comes to my mind? Um, because that is a choice that we make all the time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll see that much more clearly on Tuesday. The choice to love. That's, loving is an action. A choice to ratify a love, a choice to be faithful to a love. Those are all actions. And so it's easier in examples to give, ex, ex, you know, choose coffee, choose to drink coffee, and so on. But those are the ones that really matter. How does one pick up one's being and put it down in affirmation of what one loves, for example? I think we'll call our uh, session today to a halt, and I think the uh, conversation here so has indicated much. that, uh, uh, Margaret, you have touched a, a nerve. People are really engaged and interested in this topic, and we look forward to continuing it next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.